Welcome to Bloomberg ETF IQ. I'm Scarlett Fu. And I'm Katie Graveld. And what a time to be alive between earnings, the Fed, and also politics. And crypto. Don't forget Ether. How could I forget? Let's get to the biggest stories right now in the more than $13 trillion global ETF industry tech fueling an equity sell-off with the S&P 500 on pace for its worst day since April. This, of course, comes after a disappointing start to earnings season and doubts about that AI rally. Meanwhile, the Ether stakes are underway. Ether ETFs are falling a day after $1 billion plus traded in their debut. We're going to talk fees and flows for the top funds. Yeah, in just a moment, we'll talk about that Ether debut. Plus, we're going to talk about BlackRock's call that global active ETF assets could reach $4 trillion by 2030. We're going to do that with Jay Jacobs. But first, we welcome in Eric Valtunas from Bloomberg Intelligence taking a look at the flows right now. Eric, what do you got? Uh, Katie, uh, we are looking at a very powerful week of flows. Um, all told, $28 billion has gone into ETFs. That's like over $5 billion a day. The normal pace is $2 billion, so we're over double the normal pace of money going into ETFs. Part of this is that there is some uh, other areas to invest in. I mean, semis is on there. SPY and, the, and VU, you see those. There's a lot of S&P obviously going on here. USHY is interesting. I think this is a rotation out of the more expensive HYG into the cheaper USHY. Uh, and then Bitcoin, uh, make, it's relentless. Um, so this has been the story of the year. Basically, S&P and Bitcoin have been dominating the leaderboard. Let's look at the outflows. And there's not a lot. There is the Qs on here, which isn't, you don't, don't like to see it if you're a bull. But it, you see it's, it's not much. It's in the millions here. TLT, some outflows there. That's usually a good sign. And you see a HYG outflow probably went into USHY, was the cheaper version. And then ETHE, this is the uh, debut. This is the unlock. Grayscale converted that into an ETF, and we expected a lot of money to come out. 484, that's a lot for day one. So let's see how that compares to the rest of the Ether ETFs that launched. Uh, there was eight new ones that came out. How did they absorb that? Well, they took in more, um, a little over $100 million more. Here were the bigger ones, so iShares led. Uh, Fidelity, Bitwise, uh, and Grayscale has a mini-me version. They all took in a lot of money. All told, they took in um, about 83% of what the Bitcoin ETFs took in. So to me, that was a good sign. The volume was only about 23%. Uh, but all told, I think, you know, we're looking at probably the second or third biggest launch of all time, Katie. All right, Eric, thank you. And joining our conversation now, I'm pleased to say we have Jay Jacobs. He is head of thematic and active ETFs over at BlackRock. Great to see you in person. Great to be here. So let's talk about day one. Of course, the iShares Ethereum Trust ETF, like Eric said, leading the way. I have to say, I've been listening to Bloomberg Intelligence, so I was surprised at just the strength of this debut. Over uh, $100 million in net inflows, a $1 billion uh, traded overall across uh, the cohort there. How did it match up relative to the iShares expectations? We had high expectations because we've seen with iBit just how much interest there is in wrapping digital assets in the ETF structure. You know, if you think about what this did for investors, it brought more access to digital assets. You could buy this in a traditional brokerage account to sit alongside your stocks and bonds. It made access more convenient by simplifying things like taxes and trading and uh, overall just getting really tight liquidity on, on digital assets. So you put that together, we were very excited for the Ethereum launch and we've seen that with Ether with very great trading volume so far. Clearly a lot of demand in the first day or two. Will there be enough interest to sustain nine different Ether ETFs though down the road? Well, we certainly know that there's interest in this asset, and there's interest in this asset through ETFs. What we've seen with IBIT so far is it's trading roughly 50 to 60 percent of the total trading volume of Bitcoin ETFs overall. So that does show that investors are not just looking for convenient access. They're also looking for liquidity, for tight spreads, and for quality. So that's what we are focused on with Etha, is making sure we have that liquidity and quality behind that product. And I know you are tasked with explaining Ether to normal people. And pretend I'm your ex-college roommate and I say to you, what is this new Ether ETF? What is your elevator pitch uh, that won't bore me? Well, you, I've been on the show a few times and talked about various different innovative technologies like artificial intelligence and so on and so forth. In a lot of ways, Ether is just a bet on the innovation of blockchain technology. If we see blockchain technology get more use cases, as we see people use tokenization, use stable coins, use decentralized finance more, Ethereum's going to benefit because it's the underlying infrastructure behind it. So this is a bet on innovation in blockchain. That is very distinct from Bitcoin, though. 
Bitcoin is much more the story around a hedge against geopolitical risks, against inflation. It's more of that diversifier in a portfolio. So I want to take a hard pivot right now and talk about something other than Ether, something that could come to the ETF wrapper. I'm talking about private assets. There's been a lot of speculation after BlackRock bought Prequin, of course. Uh, your chief financial officer, Martin Small, said recently that basically uh, you're going to be able to take some of the data that Prequin has to create investable indices and also launch things like exchange traded products that has launched a number of thought pieces. And I want to ask you, I mean, when it comes to potentially constructing something like that, is it possible to put private assets into an ETF, actual private assets, not some sort of strange proxy thing? Well, I, I, I can't speak too much about our product pipeline. What I can say is that we are very focused on innovation at iShares this year. I mean, if you look at the products we've come out with, we've launched several different active ETFs that are uh, alpha seeking and bringing out our best portfolio managers into the ETF structure. We've now launched two digital asset ETFs with Bitcoin and Ethereum. We've been launching option, option strategies that wrap things like put spreads and, uh, and, and buy rights within an ETF structure. So we are seeing a tremendous amount of innovation in the ETF space, and I think that's going to continue going forward. Just hypothetically, are private assets something that you could uh, invest in passively or it would have to be an active investment because these are active choices on which assets to choose from? I think there's a lot of different approaches, but one of the ways we have to look at just the entire platform at BlackRock is just there's different structures with different use cases, whether that's an ETF, whether it's a mutual fund, whether it's semi-liquid. It's really about providing solutions to clients in the right structure. It's not just about ETFs, but ETFs are the vehicle of choice for a lot of our clients these days. Uh, let's talk about MADE. This is a new thematic ETF you came out. I know that's your background. You were at Global X. You launched PAVE, which, by the way, did you know that's the biggest theme ETF in the world? Past infrastructure, ARC. right? Yeah, infrastructure. Yeah. Past ARC about a month ago. Huh. Is this the follow-up to PAVE? Do you think it has that kind of potential? What's the pitch for this? So right now you have an incredible structural tailwind, which is just the changing supply chains around the world. That previously was about getting the cheapest goods around the world. Now it's about resilience. And that resilience starts at home. It's about how we can build the goods that are critical to our economy in the United States. Things like semiconductors, where you're seeing fabs being built in the United States. Things like electric vehicles, things like energy production. More of that is being brought back to the US. And similar to what we saw with infrastructure in the past, this has policy tailwinds across the aisle. This is about how we're seeing uh, supportive fiscal policy. This is how we're seeing different trade arrangements evolve. So I see this being a critical follow-on to infrastructure because we're trying to get more efficient in this country with infrastructure. We're trying to increase output with U.S. manufacturing. So MADE very much could be kind of the second leg of that trade. And of course, uh, potentially one to watch as we count down to November, a potential policy changes coming in a potential new administration. I'm actually not going to ask you about politics. I want to talk about active ETFs and this big call from BlackRock that active ETFs could hit $4 trillion by 2030. It's been really fascinating to watch the evolution of active ETFs. And what's striking to me is that you take a look at some of the uh, active products that are getting a lot of flows. It feels very active light. It's like systematic strategies. Uh, it's things such as JEPI and derivatives backed things. Can we truly consider those active? It's not exactly stock pickers that are getting a ton of flows. Yeah, I guess I would disagree with that somewhat. Where we've seen some of the most flows at BlackRock is in Bank, which is a fixed income product that is very active in how it chooses which sectors of the fixed income space to be selecting, as well as the individual securities. So alpha seeking ETFs in our categorization is about 80% of the assets within active. Now, active means a few things. So yes, there's kind of a stock picker or bond picker market that we're calling alpha seeking. There's also outcome oriented ETFs like buffer products that wrap options in them. There's also exposure active, which is really just trying to provide better beta to a specific area using active strategies. But overall, we absolutely see alpha seeking strategies that are active and tactical and targeted being a big driver of active ETF returns going forward. Yeah, and real quick, the buffer products and this whole, whole world of these new active, as you put it, um, how much of this is because the ag has failed? You know, it, it, didn't, it went down in 2022, and it's not kept up with inflation. Do you think investors are looking for something to uh, supplant the 40 in their bond exposure that can protect them? I think it goes beyond just looking at the ag. I think what you're seeing with a lot of investors is they're indexing the core of their portfolio. They're getting low cost, tax efficient core exposures through IVV or ag. And then they're looking beyond that to supplement it either with specific outcomes or to, uh, to, to outperform the market. And if you go back over the last 10 years, it's been a great beta fueled rally. It was 
a, fin a fantastic trade to just have exposure to the S&P 500 and the ag. Looking forward, I think alpha is going to be a more important part of people's portfolios to meet their financial objectives. And uh, I do want to bring you that headline. The Nasdaq 100 falling 3% now, biggest uh, intraday decline since December 2022. Just keeping conscious of the broader market right now. But I do want to quickly ask you about buffer ETFs. They've been very popular, a very popular category there. iShares has one as well. Some people have marketed these and talked about these as bond replacements in your portfolio. And I hear something like that, and uh, I have questions. It's, of course, uh, a big claim there. How are you thinking about buffers? Is iShares thinking about these as bond replacements? One of the biggest use cases for buffer ETFs is just bringing people back into the markets. You still see $5 trillion being held in cash or money market funds. And, you know, you look at how much the markets have rallied. A lot of investors are saying, I would have liked to invest, but I don't know if this is the right time. Am I just going to be getting in when the market sells off? Buffer ETFs help bring people into the markets while still protecting against certain downside moves. So it's one way to really just kind of ease people back into the markets, which I think is really important when so much cash is sitting on the sidelines. All right, Jay Jacobs, it is always great to see you. Appreciate you making the time. That is Jay Jacobs of BlackRock. Now coming up, ETFs representing a lower percentage of overall trading volume this year. Next, we discuss how single stocks are helping to drive the ETF share lower. And we were just discussing either ETFs. Here are some of the other firms talking about the debut. We've been working on getting Ethereum listed for six or seven years, and we finally convinced uh, our regulators here. We've entered the ETF era of crypto. We're going to see ETFs on multiple crypto assets. Some regulators have gotten more comfortable um, with first listing, sun staking, without staking, and then adding staking. The thing we've learned from the Bitcoin and Ethereum ETF launches is that ETFs work in this asset class. Welcome back to Bloomberg ETF IQ. I'm Katie Greifeld. Time now for the ETF brief where I walk you through the trends and the stories that caught my eye in the ETF industry. And I want to focus on mixed allocation ETFs. Overall, if you take a look at equity as a category, it has a lot. Bonds has a lot. Commodities has a lot. You put it all together, mixed asset, not really seeing the love. It seems like, again, advisors really want to put the pieces together themselves. Mixed asset ETFs uh, have been sort of left for dust. Let's also talk about bonds, though, a little bit in more detail, because you take a look at actively managed fixed income ETFs. And as you can see, uh, the flows have been off the charts almost. $44 billion going into active bond ETFs so far this year. We know that there's been a lot of speculation about when the Fed is going to start cutting rates, and a lot of money has been going towards bonds. Over the long term, though, let's talk about equity ETFs. They tend to account for an average of 30% of all exchange volume, but this year that share is well below the average. Some days down to 14%. As you can see, that is quite low relative to that average in white. And I guess the question is, why, Scarlett? Absolutely. So let's talk about this with Athanasio Sarafagas of Bloomberg Intelligence, who put together that data and has been examining what's been going on. What do you think is the reason behind that? Uh, stock picking is back. I feel like we, we say it every year, but I think the influence of the MAG7 has definitely attracted a lot more investors to just buy those stocks. Not saying that ETFs still aren't trading a lot, but you basically just need to hold those seven stocks. So I think there was a fair point that Eric had made too that, yes, the market is up, we're comfortable, maybe we're not freaking out, there's not a whole lot of trading. But overall, trading is still up on the exchanges. So I think that it, they're just not going to ETFs. They're going to individual stocks or they're going to options. But there's definitely more of a stock picking mentality this year. I was going to say Eric Balchunas uh, does disagree with you there because, I mean, you think about what typically happens in times of volatility. I mean, people go right for those ETFs. And I mean, I guess when we have our next huge drawdown, maybe today we'll see that share go higher once again. Yeah, I think the liquidity aspect of the ETF is so important during like a sell off. But a lot of time, if you look, whenever the market hits new highs, volume is very low. So I think that does that does drive a little bit. But maybe like today, like I said, we might see a little bit of a pickup in the in the volumes. But overall, it's just been moving over to 
to just more niche exposure, single stocks, and that necessarily doesn't bode well for ETF trading overall. Right, and ETFs themselves have become increasingly more concentrated as well. I think about all the single stock ETFs and how much attention that that's getting. With the big tech trade seemingly uh, maybe fading or even unwinding a little bit, how do you anticipate that this might start to show up in ETFs? Yeah, I think there is a second order effect. So one is they're single stock ETFs, so people trade those, they're levered. But then ETFs themselves are more concentrated. So even though you're picking an ETF, if there's 40 or 50 holdings, the stock selection is so much more important. So I think that should factor in too. You're not just buying the, the S&P 500. So if you're buying a thematic that with just so few holdings, you're essentially picking stocks too. Yes, there's less of a stock, but you're essentially a second order stock picker. It all comes back to stock picking once again. Athanasio Sarafagas of Bloomberg Intelligence, thank you so much. Now, still ahead, Maurice Pot from Tima ETFs joins us to talk about his America reshoring fund as a possible 2024 election proxy Actually, in this case, no matter who wins. This is ETF IQ on Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg ETF IQ. I'm Scarlett Fu alongside Katie Greifeld. And Eric Beltranis from Bloomberg Intelligence back with us for today's drill down where we focus on one ETF. Eric, take it away. Katie, today we are looking at RSHO, <coughs> which is short for reshoring. It's the Tema American Reshoring ETF. This caught our attention because the performance is, is really good, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, and you look here, it's already 93 million. This is a big uh, amount of money for sort of a late comer to the thematic area, this firm. And it's 75 basis points. So people are, are going to need some performance to pay those fees, right? It's been out for a little over a year. Let's look at the sort of cross section. So you're going to see a lot of sectors here like building materials. This is companies that are going to benefit from bringing uh, a lot of supply chain and doing things in the U.S., right? This is sort of a deglobalization play. And so, of course, you're going to get a lot of this sort of like, um, you know, hard construction type stocks. If you want to look at the gig sectors, it's going to be 78% industrials and then a lot of materials. That's the two main sectors in this. Um, and if you look here, the PE is 25. So, you know, it's not quite a value trade either. So, and it's all in the U.S. basically. Let's look at the performance though. And you can see the flows, by the way, recently. The performance as it came out versus the industrial sector, again, of which it's got a lot of those stocks, is, is big, 46% versus 29%. And then the S&P is up 34%. So with that kind of performance, that's a decent enough lead that you're going to get looks, uh, Katie, not to mention the sort of political timeliness of this theme. Well, that's exactly where I want to go. And joining us now to talk about it is Tema founder and CEO Moritz Pod. And you've made the point that uh, you see this working no matter what administration takes over uh, from here. Walk us through that, because you think about reshoring, that seems more of a right-leaning impulse. Hey, thanks for having me on the show today. Um, I mean, yeah, I think right now in, in the U.S. government in the upcoming election, there's not many things that both sides of the political spectrum agree on. But one thing they do consistently agree on, and is featuring increasingly in their election manifestos, is bringing jobs, investment, manufacturing back to the U.S. That was initially you know, spurred from what we saw out of COVID, when there was obviously a lot of supply chain dislocation, uh, concerned about inflation. But what was initially a tactical move is really now becoming a much more strategic move, aided by a number of government incentives, acts that have really accelerated this trend. So we're seeing a, a huge, some would call it a renaissance of reindustrialization, manufacturing, sweeping the middle of the U.S., but also parts of the coasts. You know, there are splashy announcements that companies make about reshoring their supply chain to the U.S., and then there's the actual follow-up, whether they do it or not. Are you adding the names only after doing the due diligence um, to make sure that they've taken action? Because in some ways, that would make you like a reporter where you have to follow up to make sure that uh, the company has done what it said it would do. Correct. So we are an active fund, which means that we do bottom-up fundamental research. The manager of the fund has a 25-year track record, top performing in investing in industrials. So you understand the sector, you understand the companies, and you also understand that, as you mentioned, companies sometimes say things which you don't follow up on. So we're very conscientious, and we also engage with companies. We speak with companies, we understand, well, we really follow companies quite close from an earnings perspective. And to your point, you know, there have been over 40 mega projects announced with respect to reassurance since 2022, combined estimated value about a trillion dollars. But if you think about how much is actually being spent on that trillion, we estimate it's only about 150 billion so far. 
So we're very thoughtful and very serious about actually going after companies that are dedicated to reshoring, are putting not just you know, a word of mouth there, but actually putting dollars behind it. And in some cases have actually realized or opening products, projects. These are big projects. These are projects that take a number of years, often take you know, big amounts of money to, to unlock. And therefore, we don't think these are short-term solutions. These are long-term trends. You don't build a $20 billion plant to open it tomorrow and close it next year. You, this is a 10, 20-year commitment. Some would call this the process of deglobalization. Globalization was a process that went over 20, 30 years. The process of deglobalization or relocation will take, again, another 10, 20 years. We believe we're still in the very early innings of that overall process. And, you know, one of the things, uh, the sub angles in this theme that is interesting to me is the environmental theme. You know, could this be converted into somehow an ESG play? Because if you're putting less stress on moving stuff around the world, uh, wouldn't that be helpful for the environment? Yeah, so we are not, to be clear, we're not an ESG fund, but I do believe, I think you're right, Eric, that this, you know, this iteration of reindustrialization will be a lot cleaner than previous reindustrializations we saw in some 50, 100 years ago. And we think that basically will allow for cleaner manufacturing, leaner manufacturing, and ultimately more scalable manufacturing, which will be better for all parties associated, whether it's on the environmental side, on the social side, on the government side. So we are not an ESG fund. But we do believe that we're encouraged by how we're seeing this process of manufacturing and reindustrialization take place. We believe it's characteristically different to anything we've seen before in the last 20, 30, 50 years. All right, really fascinating stuff. Appreciate you taking the time for us. Our thanks to Tema Founda, founder and CEO, Maurice Potts. And we have to talk about markets here because we are seeing quite a sell-off on our hands. The S&P 500 currently off by about 1.7 percent. The Nasdaq 100 even more. And I find this really interesting, guys. And Eric, you were talking about the flows a little bit earlier. We've been seeing this massive sell-off. and We've been seeing a lot of money coming into these funds. Uh, VU, for example, uh, breaking a record. Yeah, but also SPY has been taking in money. So the trader crowd might get, might get spooked temporarily. We'll see. The good news is the volume in SPY is only 12 billion. That's still below average. And as you talked about with Ethan, uh, volume in ETFs goes up when there's fear. Low volume means nobody's really freaking out, at least according to, the, to this one metric that we use. That's pretty, pretty good indicator. So I would, I would think this would be short-lived, but we'll see. You know, the other thing that's worth pointing out, of course, is that rotation of small caps is still kind of in place. I, the Russell 2000 is down right now, but it has been outperforming even when it's down uh, compared with the big cap stocks and the Nasdaq overall. What kind of flows have you been seeing into the Russell? Yeah, they've been big. People are people, but we've seen this movie before, yes. right? There's flows into Ida. People have tried so hard, uh, and then it doesn't work. So maybe it will work this time. I thought it was going to work for a while. We had like a week where it was up, but yeah, breadth is what everybody wants to see. All right, a lot to keep track of here. We'll continue to follow it throughout the day on Bloomberg Television, but that does it for Bloomberg ETF IQ. I'm Katie Greifeld, along with Scarlett Fu and Eric Beltunas. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>